to start our audience discussion uh, this year on the theme of the, the renewal being the identity and the relevance of the gospel. The gospel is a deep well and it needs to be uh, the cool uh, living water, the life-giving water within the well has to be, has to be drawn up. And so that's what we want to do uh, in the discussion is uh, draw things up uh, out of this well of salvation. We do want, of course, all things uh, to be done unto edifying, and we want all things uh, said in the, in the discussion for all the brethren to be able to say amen to it. That's, so we want to open up for uh, the brethren to, to tell uh, the things that you have seen and heard, whether that be uh, things old or things new. You know, in your bag, you can uh, bring us things that you have just recently seen uh, having been at the renewal or, or something that you uh, have seen in anticipation of the renewal, uh, we want we want that to be uh, uh, to be heard as well. You can give also give thanks for for things that have been said at the renewal. I think that's beneficial for for brethren to say now now brother so and so said this and this, uh, you know I, I I took that and and put it in my bag and give thanks for specific things that have been that have been said at the renewal, and also to further expand on things that have been uh, said at at the renewal. Uh, just this year. So we want the, the result of the discussion to, uh, to be that, your, that our grasp on the, on the truth itself is, is strengthened. We want to assist one another in, in uh, showing the truth to one another and, and articulating the, uh, the things that we have seen and heard. And uh, we, we don't just meet together just, just to talk. In fact, the kingdom of God is not just in words, it, but it's in power. So we want to strengthen our, our grasp on the truth because the, uh, there, there are some influences that you will encounter that, that are contrary to your grasp on the truth. So we want that to be, uh, to be firmed up. Uh, we want the, uh, as, we, as we're serving the Lord, the, the one objective is that the workmen be, be not ashamed. And so... Uh, having a having a firm uh, grasp on the truth, being able being able to work with the truth like a like a craftsman, you know, when the Lord gave the instructions uh, for building the tabernacle, uh, he gave he gave special wisdom to uh, to certain uh, people. They they just come out of they were slaves, you know. They made they made bricks, right? And so now they're going to build this this uh, elaborate structure called the tabernacle, and it wasn't going to be all made out of bricks, and that's that was like the extent of their. Uh, of their experience and of their expertise, right? And so the, the Lord gave them, uh, certain ones, uh, specific ability and understanding uh, to work with different, different kinds of, of, of material that was going to go in this, in this tabernacle. The Lord has done, done the same on a grander scale in, in the gospel, is that he, he gives wisdom, um, like craftsmen, uh, to different parts of the body to, to work in the kingdom. And, they, and he puts them to work. So, so we want to hone our skills and our trade, uh, being able to handle the truth, handle the word of God. The word of God is the, is the sword of the spirit, and we, we have to be skillful in wielding of that sword to be able to make, make, um, make application of the word. So the, the first thing that I want to do in the discussion as we uh, open the floor is I, I ask you to put in from your perception, from your grasp of the, of the gospel, I want you to summarize the identity of the gospel. I think there's, there's still a lot of room left, even after uh, being the third day of the renewal, there's still a lot of room left here uh, for, for, for stating the identity of the gospel. And the gospel is, is big enough that we can, uh, it needs to be summarized. There's like, there's like uh, mountain peak uh, perspectives of the gospel where we can, where we can summarize. It's like getting a, getting a wide angle view. And that view is very, is very needful to be able, just like uh, Moses was uh, taken up to the mount to, to view the whole land. And that, that view is a very, very needful, very advantageous view of, of the gospel to be able to see it from that high vantage point. But there's also a, uh, like a telephoto view where like the, the, uh, um, the spies went into the land and they actually spied out the land. They were down 
uh, in, actually in the promised land. And they, they're the ones that brought the grapes back out of the promised land. So there's this, there's this mountain view that Moses had, and then there's the spy view that the, that the 12 spies had. So we want to be able to view the gospel from both, zoom in and to get the, the wide angle view. And so we want to be able to uh, identify the gospel from both perspectives. They're both valid and they're both, they're both needful uh, perspectives of the gospel. So at this point, the, the, the floor is open. You just uh, show me uh, your hand um, and we'll call on you and you make your way up. We want to start by identifying the identity of the gospel. There's other, um, other ways that the, the Holy Spirit has drawn uh, in the scriptures. He's, uh, the Holy Spirit has used um, uh, architecture as a, as a tool to, to illustrate the kingdom. The word edify is uh, like an architectural word. It's ed- edifice, to build up. And so the, the gospel has like a foundational level. There are things, uh, that, things that Jesus did are at a, at a foundational level. There's a work of the Spirit that is at the foundational level. There are words in, found in the prophets that are at the foundational level. But then there's also, the, as the structure comes together, there's different pieces and different parts that go, that go into the structure. And then as the structure is completed, then there are things that go into the structure to make that structure uh, profitable to, the, uh, to those dwelling in there. And so, that, see, the gospel has these different, different parts that we want to be able to we want to be able to know um, what, what is in the foundation of the gospel and what is in the walls, the structure of the gospel, and what, are, what is garnishing uh, as um, the, the, in, the inward parts of the gospel and what is uh, dressed on the outside of the gospel. And the Holy Spirit has made this type of analogy with, with uh, structure. He said, you are God's building. That's where, that's where I uh, take that that uh, illusion. But the, the Lord, the Holy Spirit also uses um, the analogy of, uh, from the world, uh, from the creation, you, you understand, of, um, of uh, biology, of things growing. He says, you are God's building, you are also God's husbandry. And so the, the gospel can be viewed like uh, uh, Jesus used the same analogy, of, I am the vine, you are the branches. And so the, the Lord has given us he created the world. When the Lord created this earth, he was really thinking about salvation. And so that's why uh, these, these analogies, these, uh, these likenesses, are like, they're like built in. They're like ingrained into the, into the creation because the creation is the, is the stage, the environment in which the gospel is going to, going to work and be effective for, for mankind. And so in, in regards to uh, the... Uh, uh, the biology, so to speak, of the, of the gospel, there's a root that's underground. And the, the root has to, you know, is drawing the nutrients and, at, and is the stability of the, of the tree or the plant. And there's, there's also the, the, the trunk of the tree, and then there's the, the fruit. Um, but we want to be able to handle the gospel in, in such a way as to, to be able to uh, divide and, and re- represent and express what are the roots of the gospel. And what, are, what is the, the trunk of the gospel? And what is the fruit of the gospel? So in this way, uh, we, we need to uh, grow in our expressions and our grasp and our understanding of the gospel to be able to, to work with these things like, a, like a, the, the craftsman did uh, in the building of the tabernacle. There are, um, now I'm, I'm continuing because I haven't seen any hands yet. So are there, are there anyone, is there anyone that has a, uh, uh, something to add. Okay. Okay. The um, the gospel is represented in several different ways. Enoch, why don't you go ahead and come down here, and um, and we'll get ready for uh, you to share something with us. The gospel is represented as the gospel of the kingdom, and that tells us that the gospel is otherworldly. It's the gospel of the kingdom, heavenly kingdom, the, the, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Christ, the eternal kingdom, the kingdom that Daniel spoke of that's going to fill the, fill the whole earth. So the gospel of the kingdom tells us it's an, other, it's an otherworldly gospel. It's also uh, communicated as the gospel of Jesus Christ. See, these are identifying the gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ tells that Jesus is the, the, um, the proprietor of the gospel. 
He's the one that made, he's like the steward of the gospel, of, of implementing the gospel, making the gospel work. He's putting it, putting it into, uh, into, into motion in the, go, in, in the world, in men, in the hearts and in the minds and in the ears of men. He's like the, he's the proprietor of the gospel. So there's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's also expressed as the gospel of God because he is the architect and the engineer of God, of, of the gospel. So it's the gospel of God. He's the, he's the source. It was brought out by one of the, the brothers preaching that the gospel is not God's response to the condition of man. It's his purpose. The gospel is God's purpose. The purpose actually existed before men ever did anything. So it's not his response. God, God is the architect and the engineer of the gospel. The gospel is also called the gospel of peace. So that identifies the benefit of the gospel. There is also the gospel that was preached unto Abraham. So there's the, an aspect of the promise and prophecy of the gospel that came before the, um, the, the gospel being offered, before the gospel was, was effective, before the gospel was, was in place, before the gospel was preached, it was promised. And it was, it was prophesied. So see, all of these are showing us that the, there's like a structure to the, to the gospel that has, been, um, that has been laid and has been build, built and being put into place. And this is all uh, the work of the Lord, and it is uh, marvelous in our eyes. Okay, Sister June is going to start. One of the things that uh, this renewal has done, uh, many people are familiar with the preaching of the gospel. It's, it's not a strange word or a strange concept to the brethren that have come and attended these meetings. But, uh, and some of this is from uh, our, our background in Christendom, it seems as though the gospel has been um, has been encapsulated and made separate from a lot of things that shouldn't be separate from. When you think of the gospel, it's not only a message that is given to men in disassociation from anything else God is or is doing. The gospel is the expression of God himself as it's unfolded in the redemption of mankind. But the gospel's genesis, just like everything else, is the person of God himself. The kindness of God toward us. God was kind before the foundation of the world. And God was merciful before the foundation of the world. And God was love at all times. And God, all the things that we, we are revealed about God through his ways and in his dealings with us were true of him, but they were not seen necessarily in, in, their, in their glory. It, it need, these, these qualities of God needed a larger forum, if you will, in order to be truly seen by his, his, create, his created beings, the angels and the seraphim and the living creatures. And I, I don't see how you could be in the presence of God and, and not have a you know a good inkling of his goodness but it wasn't laid out in as much detail before he created the earth and before he created man with man being created in god's image an image is always for a reason if it's a created image it is to demonstrate or to show or to reveal something about the thing it images now, we were specifically made in the image of God. It means there's a big purpose that's associated with that. And the gospel, in, in God's dealings with us, now we're getting a picture of God's image in his people. We're, we're seeing God more precisely and with greater detail, with more light, with greater clarity, than can be seen in any other way. You think about it now. Whenever Jesus was in the garden and he was about to lay down his life, to pour out his soul as an offering for sin, when he prayed in the garden, Father, if it be possible, 
let this cup pass from me. Now this work is large enough that it absolutely required that that cup not pass from the Lord, that he had to drink the dregs of the wrath of God for us in order that, that things in heaven and in th things in earth would be purified and that God would be at liberty to, to bring us, to, to actually call us into the fellowship of the divine nature and to uh, create us anew and to take away this, the, the offense and the, the reproach of sin before the face of God. This is a great cost. So for people to think about the gospel as a, as a little, you know, you open your, your, your book and you've got like three points. And if I care, I cover these three points. Now I've covered the gospel. And then we talk about something else and it has nothing to do with it. No, the creation of the world had something to do with the gospel. The sending of the Savior had something to do with the gospel. What, how we were made and what we were made has something to do with the gospel. Our living unto God, our dying unto God, and our glorification in heaven have something to do with the gospel. It's like this is the central reason for everything else that we know about. It's, it is expressed very precisely in the doctrine. And, but we've got to be able to make the connections. And I appreciated the things that the brethren said um, the, whenever they talked about our prayers, when, whenever they, they discussed uh, our justification, the, all of these details. See, if you can't plug your understanding into the gospel somewhere, well, then your understanding is not complete. This is the message of the church this is the banner that we bear that that god is he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him that he is good and that he has sent his son into the earth because he's holy and righteous and merciful and that his son took on the nature of man lived in the flesh died made his made himself an offering for sin and then he, he took the commandment, he obeyed the commandment of the Father and he took up his life and lived again that we might live in him and only in him, I might admit. So, but the brethren have, uh, they've just, um, I've appreciated the fact that these things were brought in and instead of the little pigeonhole view that off time is presented to us as the gospel, that they've expanded that and they've made a lot of those connections and I thank them for their labors. Hello, my name is Enoch. When Brother Tony was talking about truth, I thought that we belong in this truth. Jesus um, spoke the word of truth. <clears throat> the gospel has many facets. It's like a jewel that you can turn and see many different elements of. And the one aspect of the gospel that has been made clear to me this week is that it has everything to do with the eternal purpose of God. The gospel is exposing us to the revelatory power of the God of our salvation. The gospel makes you not unholy, it makes you unblameable in the sight of the Lord. And dying to self gives the gospel free reign in your heart. There are many things that the brethren have said that have been worth writing down, but if all of us were to say all that has blessed us, then we'd be here for a while. So Brother Pat Woods, speaking of a gospel not of man, said that you can tell what kind of gospel is being preached by the reaction of God's people when they hear it. I thought if there's, if there's conflict between the teacher and God's people, the ones who are really sincere about the gospel, if there's conflict between that, then the gospel is of man that's being taught. But if it's met with agreement, if it's accepted among the people of God, then 
the message being preached has come from God. I also want to connect a couple of things that were said within a day, about a day of each other. Sister Bailey said that in order to stand on the gospel, you first have to understand it. And Brother Bob earlier today said that you have to know Christ before you can teach him. I think that's saying the same thing two different ways, but again, it's a different aspect of the same jewel. I thought if you don't know, if you don't trust something, you don't trust something you don't know about. If you don't know about something, and if you're ignorant of it, then you're not going to put your full trust in it. So our full trust is in God, and that's why we can stand on the gospel, and that's why we can teach Christ. Brother Tim McCulfer said that people sitting in pews swallowing are swallowing whatever is put into their mouths, and that's what ca what's causing them to be damned. He also said that false doctrine is like poison. So, people sitting in pews of Babylon are being fed poison, and they're taking it ignorantly. So, this false doctrine eats away at spiritual life. The acidity, so to speak, of a false gospel will take away your spiritual taste buds, so to speak. A foreign gospel does that, but the gospel from God, it hones them. It makes you be able to, it, your spiritual taste buds are sharper when you hear the gospel. So, thanks to the brethren for their labors in the truth, it's been, it's been very good. I also want to particularly thank Brother Bill for that, Brother Bill Dinwiddie for that testimony. He is very zealous for the truth, and he made that evident today in the testimony. I do want to make a clarification because the gospel is a particular message. I did not mean to imply that the gospel was not a particular thing, but its implications are far reaching. And we've been able to make some of the, the applications and the implications of the reception of that gospel. But that when we say the gospel, there is a gospel and it is something that is preached. I very much appreciated how thoroughly um, this has been expounded throughout these past couple of days. Um, we've been able to see varied perspectives from many different members of, of the body, uh, from different ages and, and different stances in life. So we can see that this is not uh, God. God works in, in all, all of these people. Now, the gospel is, is God's appointed means of working out his purpose in the earth concerning humanity. Uh, we are called to him by means of the gospel initially, and um, we are perfected by the gospel as we continue in it. And uh, we have our hope in what is yet to come as promised in the message of the gospel. See, it's, he, he works out all of this through this, through this message. Uh, I appreciated what some of the brethren have said about this, um, asking the question, why did God choose to save them that believe through the foolishness of preaching the gospel? And I suppose you could say that he did this because he wanted to, but really it, it's more edifying to be able to see this, this higher perspective of it, that uh, the, the gospel is in every way suited for the purpose of God and redemption. Uh, he's not saved us without our knowledge and our involvement in it, because this is, this is perfectly in order of what he wanted to do. He wanted to make himself known in this. Um, I appreciated what Brother Silas said about this, um, that when Paul called the gospel my gospel, uh, that, that just shows that he was, he was transformed. So much had he allied himself with the message of the gospel that he called it my gospel. So uh, we're, we're, we are workers together with God and, and being able to, to preach this message. And in doing this, we're uh, culturing ourselves for our heavenly occupation. Hi, brethren. Um, when we are talking about the gospel, I was uh, thinking there is only one gospel that uh, from God, and that the Lord has given us uh, this gospel, and it is His. And also, um, 
What Brother Tony said, um, what edified me was uh, when he was speaking about the fight of the Lord, I thought that um, fight the good fight of faith. We need to hear this over and over. And also, the good fight of faith is the gospel, a piece of gospel, the good fight of faith. Thank you, brethren. I've been very thankful this year for all of the messages so far, but um, since there are so many of them, I just wanted to comment on one, and that was Brother Jason's, and he said that we cannot be ignorant of the gospel. The truth is that we can't afford to be ignorant. We are in a time where God has opened up the gospel to us, and we're in a time where God has provided um, several different means for us to receive the gospel. Um, we have um, CD players, we have DVD players, and um, internet access, and these are things that we can use in order to um, listen to and watch the gospel be preached. Um, I've heard many brethren who are thankful for the live stream, and that's another way the gospel is able to be preached. Um, no man will have an excuse on the judgment day for not taking heed unto the gospel. No one will be able to say, well, I didn't know about it, or I thought I'd get a second chance. God is a just God, and I do not believe that he would leave anyone without a chance at least once in their life to repent and hear the gospel. And those who have repented and received receive the gospel will have eternal life. I'm very thankful for these renewals. I shared with some of the brethren during the break time that when we come to these renewals, I'm reminded of the gathering that we will, we will um, be in in heaven. And I'm thankful for the picture that that is here because right now we are fellowshipping, but there we have an infirmity. We have the flesh. And so I'm thankful and anticipate that day. And I know you brethren do too. As we all know, there have been many aspects that have been shown throughout this whole renewal concerning the gospel. And I especially am thankful for, especially the preachers who have, who have been given this opportunity to speak and who have taken full advantage of it. One of my favorite aspects that was brought out this year was the aspect of the gospel gives men hope. And how, I think it was Brother, Brother Matt who said that the gospel is a report on what God has accomplished. Because this work was accomplished, we now have hope and can look forward to something. And now that this gospel has been shown to us, we now can see that there is no longer a gap between men and God, but now that we can come freely to him. As I see things, preaching the gospel is a very challenging assignment. I think it's been dramatically oversimplified in our society. We don't actually have very many examples of the gospel actually being preached in the book of Acts. It's interesting. It wasn't preached at Athens. In Antioch of Pisidia, the only thing that was said was that in Christ we are justified from all things from which we could not be justified by the law of Moses. And there wasn't any hint of it, as we know it, being preached to the raw heathen people didn't have a Jewish background. Just, it's just interesting to observe. See, the gospel... People have to want to hear good news before it can be good news. Someone that sees no need for Christ, it's impossible for the gospel to sound good. It just doesn't. That's all there is to it. That, and that's the challenging thing of our society. This is going to sound almost heretical, but I don't think our society is ready for very much gospel. It's not convicted of sin. It's not persuaded of heaven. It doesn't see dangers in the earth. 
it's not that kind of society. Now there's men who are, can be expert in presentation, can take this situation and work their way to the gospel. I understand that, it, that ought to be done, but at this present time, this is my opinion, but the most needy society that needs to hear the gospel is the church. And until this thing is seen by the church, I see all other efforts as nearly worthless. And uh, I couldn't say that. <laughs> Many people would think I was a heretic, you know, but I see, I think I could defend what I just said also. So I'm particularly thankful that this was said to people that know the human condition. If you don't know the human condition, you you got you got to make that known first. And the only thing that can make that known is the law. That's what it's for. It's a schoolmaster to bring you to Christ. Now, you remember when Paul reasoned with Felix about righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. Remember that? He didn't tell him one syllable of gospel. But here's what he told him. See, a lot of people don't know what that means. He reasoned with him of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. This age has to be told this. You have to be righteous. You don't have a choice in this matter. It doesn't buy, it doesn't, it's not sufficient to say I'm not righteous. That's not sufficient. You have to be righteous. You have to be. And you have to be temperate. You have to control your life. You have to do it. Yeah, yeah there's no need to say we can't do it or that. People have to be told this. And you are going to be judged. And I don't think that the majority of people are convinced of any one of those. But that's our assignment. I think but this has to be preached strongly. I'm sorry the church is always apologizing for the ungodly people that are in it. And there's people make the professed church, I'm saying. And there's people making excuses and telling us why people haven't done this and why they haven't done that. No, you don't, there's no excuse. You have to be righteous. And until you see that I have to be righteous, God's not going to accept me if I'm not. Now, when a person finally says, all right, I accept it. Now we got some good news. But it's not really good until then. And uh, I, I kind of had to say that. It's, it's kind of burning on my soul that we preach the gospel to the right people Amen. this week. And now when you try and influence other people for Christ, Believe me when I tell you that if you say that Christ can solve your problems and Christ can straighten out your life, this is pretty near zero. Yeah. That really is not why Jesus came. Right. Jesus did not come to straighten out our lives. He came to reconcile us to God. Amen. And that's all the difference in the world. I, I, I better stop. <laughs> <laughs> I want to take a stab at summarizing the theme, I, the identity and the relevance of the gospel. This, it's a challenge to try to summarize anything in Scripture because it's such a large, a large thing. But this is a good discipline uh, for our minds, particularly if you, if you preach and teach. You've got to be able to summarize it, uh, otherwise you're not really clear. So the identity of the gospel, here's my, here's my attempt to summarize it. The gospel is the report of what God has done in Christ to execute his eternal purpose 
which is to glorify those in Christ, transforming those who bear the likeness of Adam into the likeness of God's Son, so that they themselves become sons of God, sharing in the divine life and nature. The, the relevance of the gospel. The gospel is relevant because it addresses man's deepest need, which is fellowship with God himself. Man was created by God and for God, and without God we die, withering in eternal ruin and uselessness. The gospel reconciles men to God, bringing them into divine life and fellowship. Therefore, it's relevant. I agree with Brother Given and, uh, and the rest of you. But I believe what has happened to the majority of the church people today is like Eve was beguiled by Satan who said, no, you won't surely die. They have bought into that because you hear it in what they say. God loves everybody and he loves them just the way they are. This is a lie and it's from Satan. If you, if you, I kind of look at the gospel, I know it's good news, but there's bad news for those who don't believe in it, and that bad news is eternal damnation in hell forever and ever. And if you don't believe that, you really don't have any need for the good news. And, and I believe that's where the church is today. And, and I don't know how, but I'm going to try to convince them of it if, if just telling them you're going to hell. Now, they might send me on my way, but that's okay too. <laughs> seems to me that the gospel is the, the record that God has given concerning his son and the great salvation that he is uh, working out in him to the end that God will accomplish his eternal will. Um, the gospel is it's that, it's that record or announcement or unveiling of the scope and focus of of God doing that work, which I mean is so it's, so it can be broad, but it, all, it can also be it can also be focused um, in specifically those those things, and primarily that of God and Christ. And so whenever you hear the gospel preached, it's drawing your attention to God and Christ, and then and then all the uh, ripple effects of that of their working. <clears throat> so God really is showing men Himself. And that, and, that, and that in Christ, and specifically in the cross, God is showing his, he's showing himself in the sense that he's showing his wrath toward sin. Yeah. And, and he's showing his, his, his love toward man, and he's, he's showing his justice in mercy and a means of satisfying himself. <clears throat> and in the aftermath of the cross, God is showing first to his son and then by extension and through his son to us that, that he is gracious and that he is kind and that he is in fact a rewarder. So a, a, you know, as, as a result of the cross of, of Christ, God is showing that he is a rewarder for those that diligently seek him. In other words, he, he is now able to do that very thing. He's able to bless through that, that seed. And the revelation of these things is, is the glad tidings of the divine person and work. It is, it's good news of, of that as far as I can see it. That we need to be ready be to be righteous so on the Lord's Day we will be ready. If we aren't ready, you are not going to heaven.
I'd like to make a recommendation that you pick out someone that's not in Christ and present this, you got to be righteous, you have to control your life, and you're going to appear at the judgment. And you have, the gospel is an announcement of a righteousness from God. Yes, he covers it. And you, it's the announcement you can resist the devil and keep under your body and let be temperate and that you'll be able to pass the judgment day. See, it addresses all of those matters. But I made a determination to do this. And, well, I'm not going to tell you the reactions, but I'll, I'll tell you, you get a different kind of reaction than if you try the church method. You'll get a different kind of reaction. So I recommend you try that. Reason with them, righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. Don't say this is nice. This has got to be done. God's not going to approve you if this isn't done. You've got to make that stick. Then when they see my hope and say, and God is able to make it happen. Amen. <laughs> Sister Debbie and I have a, are in a unique position. Many of you in our fellowship know that we get the opportunity to do that thing every Wednesday afternoon, just what Brother Given said. We have an audience with young people, which uh, someone from our ministry has been there at our county juvenile center for more than 25 years. And uh, uh, I've been doing it for the last seven years. Uh, it'll be seven years in January. Debbie's been doing it for with me for the last four years and uh, we have anywhere between two and twelve young people between the ages of twelve and sixteen every Wednesday afternoon every other Sunday morning now, on Sunday mornings uh, I, I normally teach a lesson from the Gospel of John and focus on certain specific things about what Jesus said and did but on Wednesday afternoons we have an open I, I leave it more open, and I specifically speak about these issues, and I really drive it home. We've had reactions of young people weeping silently to themselves, uh, some of them being frightened, some of them saying, oh, this, that's not fair. That's not right. God shouldn't treat people that way, and every kind of reaction in between. Uh, some have, a few, a very few have responded positively. A couple have asked us to baptize them. And I don't teach anything about baptism. The ones that ask us, I hadn't said, to my recollection, I hadn't said a word about baptism. They'd read it themselves. We supply Bibles for them. And they'd read it in the book of Acts. Or they'd read it in a couple of times that, that uh, Paul mentions it in his letters. And they said, would you baptize me? Like the eunuch said to Philip, <laughs> here's water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? What hinders me from being baptized? So, uh, so you can get that kind of reaction. This is a unique situation. God has put us in it. I left here yesterday afternoon to go do that. I told somebody, I have an appointment. I've got to keep it. I didn't make the appointment. God did. I've got to keep that appointment every Wednesday afternoon. Unless something hinders me, completely hinders me. And I had uh, two boys and a girl. Uh, and sometimes we get to speak to them for several weeks. Uh, sometimes just once. And we don't know what God does with that. Just like Philip didn't know what God did with the circumstance with the eunuch. He was taken away. He didn't know that the eunuch went on his way rejoicing, although he likely hoped, we certainly hoped, he certainly hoped that he did and likely thought that he did. So uh, there are those who are willing to hear. Uh, give you an opportunity to speak at any rate. You won't get many audiences like we have. Like we have. <laughs> Some of them just come because they want to get out of the room. They're not really interested in what we're saying, but who knows? And I look them right in the eye and it says, we're planting this truth of God in you right now. God made this appointment for you to be here. We were going to be here. I said, it... <laughs> 
It may be a hard thing for you to think about because you're confined here and you can't leave until you're given permission to leave. You can't watch TV. They do have a little TV to let them watch. They can't go out in the gym and shoot baskets. They can't do anything. They can't eat until they get permission and somebody brings them food. So it's a harsh environment, but God, I tell them, God made this appointment for you to be here and for us to speak these things to you. And they're difficult things for you to hear, but they're true things. And you must make a decision. You have no choice. So it's a good thing, very satisfying thing for us as believers to be able to speak these things in this matter, in this matter, manner. And uh, God will use that truth. He will use that truth. So find someone, as our brother said, find someone and uh, do that very thing. Maybe you'll be able to, like us, find many. I have very much appreciated this renewal more than any I have been at before. I have, um, I'm able to retain more. I remember the first one I went to, and I remember many times being told, if you can get one thing, hang on to it. Well, I am, I've been able to, re, I have been able to, to partake of a lot of things from every single person that has spoken. And um, I wanted to uh, bring out, you know, I um, get the uh, opportunity to speak to girls at, um, it's, it's a care net. It's for young girls who come and it's free service. And um, before they leave, I tell them I'm gonna share some things with you. And uh, first of all, I tell them that, now if I saw you in a burning building and I just walked past and said, boy, I sure hope you get out of there, good luck to you. I said, does that show I care? And they get it. And then I tell them, it's like, I'm gonna tell you some truth here because there's a judgment day coming and nobody's gonna have any excuses on that day. And I said, somebody told me the truth. And so that's why I'm here, so I can share the truth. I remember one night I was on my way home and I called and Brother Jeremy answered the phone and I said, you know, sometimes I feel like I'm not doing any good. And he said, you know what, sister? He says, do you know what it took for God to arrange that person to go to that particular care net on that particular night that you volunteer at the time you're there? So he said, don't think that way. And, and I've thought of that over and over again. And I just wanted to share real quick with you one time, there was a, there was a young man and his girlfriend and his mother came in and because we're talking about how we, we express it differently than the church nowadays do, you know. And um, anyway, they came in and, and I, I, I got to that part and he said, well, I'm an atheist. And, um, and he kind of, you know, was kind of haughty about it. And I just, I just looked over to him and I said, well, maybe you weren't chosen. And then I went on talking with the other two and he didn't leave the room. And when I was finished, those two were listening, and I didn't even look at the other man, the young man. And when I got up, I, I prayed with them before they left, and they hugged me, and he came to me and hugged me. And he didn't walk out, so you never know what you might say that's going to get somebody's attention. But I wasn't meaning it to be, to, I wasn't trying to be haughty or anything. It was just like he blurted that out, so I just told him I just said well maybe you weren't chosen because I was telling him the truth because we don't you know but I shared it anyway and I tell different ones it's like I'm gonna scatter some seed and one day it's gonna be revealed what you are because you are one of the three soils you're either hard or it might spring up quick or you might have some good soil but I said it'll be revealed and we will see each other again thank you brother Um, I was just really blessed this week, so thank you everyone who came up here and shared. Um, one of the things that really got to me is, um, you know, the gospel is good news. And because the gospel is good news, I don't want to keep that to myself anymore. I want to go out and share that with people. You know, because usually, like, I'm kind of embarrassed or ashamed of the gospel, you could say. But now I realize that I want to share that with other people so they get to know the good news and that they know that there is hope for them. And the only hope is through Jesus Christ. And I want them to know that because I want my friends and family to be in heaven with me one day. And so I don't want to keep that to myself anymore. Thank you. Amen. 
Um, I liked when uh, Brother Bob talked about the new man. We need a new man, but we don't need the old man because the new man is from God and the old man is from Adam. And the body from Christ is powerful, but the old man is weak. So I chose the new man from God. Thank you, brethren. From a, from a high point of view, the gospel is the only thing that God is doing in the present time. And for the part that's mainly emphasized among men, there's, uh, there's a lot of preparation up to the time when Christ came into the world and put away sin. But even, even all that preparation, even before the world began, preparation was being made and, and all of this and what happened after Christ died and ascended and the things that we've been promised that we shall be and how we will spend eternity and our fellowship with the Father and the Son and Father we, we shall see his face all these things everything that God has revealed is the gospel but then there's this there's a certain point in what he's doing where there's a, like a, a door, I might even say it's a narrow door, it's a small door where men can get into this and get involved in it. Now that, there's a message that comes with this door. When you don't get to hear the whole thing. You know, when you, if, if you know someone that's a sinner and they're, they're lost and you don't start preaching back there about what God did before the foundations of the world. You don't start there. You, there, you talk about right here. This is, this is the only place you're getting in. You've got to acknowledge the Lord's Christ and your need uh, to be free from your sin and the day of judgment coming and these kinds of things. And this is the part that uh, a lot of people think that's all the gospel is, is just that message. But then when you get inside then you get to hear all the rest of the gospel too. All the things that they're, the gospel preached to Adam and Eve in the garden and the gospel preached to Abraham and the gospel in the wilderness and the prophets testifying of the Christ that would come. And then after Christ ascended, all, you, all this gets opened up to you. So it's really this, in the present time, this is the only thing God is doing. So from that's why I say from that point of view, that's all he's doing is the gospel. And then for the, the part of identifying it, of course, we're talking about men being able to identify it. And it's a, the gospel, of course, is a, it's a spiritual message. It's a heavenly message, an otherworldly message. So the only way it can be identified is if the Holy Spirit reveals it to you. <clears throat> One thing that I uh, really appreciated this week was something that Brother Dan said, and he said that the gospel is the divine provision in the wilderness. And this just reminded me of one of the reasons why we started coming out here in the first place. Um, we were seeking to hear the gospel, and you, you, it's very distinct. It's a distinct message, and you can recognize it right away when you hear it, and that's what caused us to keep coming back. And it's good to know that even when we're in the wilderness, and it may be see more perilous at times that God provides for his people in that way through a message and we benefit from it when we believe it. So I was very thankful for that reminder this week and thankful that this is a place that the gospel is consistently and powerfully proclaimed um, to build up his people. I hope you don't think this is an oversimplification, but the, go the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. And I think, uh, you know, we ought to, we ought to be able to uh, express our, uh, you know, whatever we're saying in our own words, we ought to be able to express them with some word that God has said as well. See, then we know that we're on safe, safe grounds. Now, now I, I really have appreciated this uh, perspective of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. That's a uh, I think that's something that uh, that I had uh, I had missed in the past. Uh, you know, Jesus said the same thing in John 16 that the when He, the Spirit of Truth, is come, He shall He, he shall speak to the world of, of right of sin and righteousness and judgment of sin because they believe not on Me of righteousness because they go to My Father and of judgment because the Prince of this world is judged. So, uh, but. 
I want to say that when we're preaching the gospel to the church, I want to talk about that. Now, there's, it's one thing when we're preaching the gospel to, to sinners, and, uh, but it's another thing when we're preaching to the pe people that we know have already, they've already repented. They've already, they've already taken care of the, these matters. Now, now the, there's, there are, there's just wonderful declarations in the word of God that they're, exp they're all over. It's a minefield full of these things. Now, some of them like, you know, we, we all know that uh, like John 3.16, now that's been overplayed uh, uh, very much, you know, but just uh, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the son of man be lifted up that every whosoever believeth on him should have, uh, should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, now we can say that and say, well, let's go on to the next point, but let's but this is a deep well. Right. See, these, these, these utterances are deep wells where you can camp out. I'm just telling you that they are, each one of them. See, if you ponder them, each one of them, see now as, as the church, as the church now, see now it's our commission, it's our, it's our business. I just say it's our business to, to dig into these things. You know, that, uh, you know some, some other things, you know, God, has, God commends his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. See, that's a, that's a theological argument, see, if there ever was one, see. Now, here, think about this one now. Uh, God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. And he's given unto us the, the word of reconciliation. See, now, now, all of these, see, and there's just so many... Uh, there's just, and I think of like an Acts, what the, what, the, what the eunuch was reading there, he said, you know, he was reading there in Isaiah chapter 53, and this, this passage, in his humiliation, his judgment was taken away, his, his, uh, the, his uh, right to a right judgment, and uh, who shall declare his gen uh, generation? But, but see, now, th these are like deep wells. See, if you, if you, you know, if, for, if, you, uh, if you ponder these things, you, you, you want to be affected by, by the Savior. You want to be affected by his sufferings. We want the, we want the gospel to affect us. You know, we, we want the, the preciousness of the gospel. This is a precious gospel, and we want it to affect us. And, and I'll just tell you, when, when, you're pro when you're affected like this by the gospel, you don't have any, there's no difficulty preaching it to anybody else. I'll just tell you, I, you know, when, I was, uh, when I was in college, I used to feel like I had to, to talk to other people. But, but if you know that if you've got something to say, if you have a message if you, that, the, that God has given you, you see, you, it doesn't matter whether you're talking to one person or 5,000, really. It just, uh, you know, it, it, the, Lord will, the Lord will give you grace to say it, see. And I, I just encourage you, but, the, but the, I just, the, these utterances in the Word of God that encapsulate, these are words that the Holy Spirit has, has spoken, see. He has, he has carved out these expressions, see. Now, now we, we take these words and we, we get them inside of us and we... we uh, Meditate on them and, and let them expand in our heart's affection and our understanding, and, and God will God'll use us. I think Christ sure has earned a lot of spoils for us, hasn't he? This is a deep well that we're pulling from, this gospel. I'm going to do my best to uh, summarize what my, my perception, at least, of what the gospel is. I guess from the large picture, <clears throat> it's the declaration of God's good pleasure in working his purpose. So whatever God is doing, he's, he's happy to do it. It's, that's what he wants to do. It's his good pleasure. It's what he's doing. And the narrow focus, I guess, from, and this is like, the grapes that I could gather. I mean, I've, I've, there's a lot more in here, but it's the it's kind of the, it's the redemption, justification, sanctification, and glorification of those who have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, specifically through the working of Christ unto God's glory by the thanksgiving of those who have been redeemed. So this is like a summary, I guess, and I've. I've also um, am particularly thankful of 
of this gospel in the wilderness perspective and the, in its effectiveness to keep those who God has, has justified. Because as we know, the work of the gospel is not complete. Where There's still hope that's found. There's still hope to be laid hold on, right? I mean, there's, I don't think anybody's confessed that they've apprehended that for which they've been apprehended by Christ. And one of these, I guess my, my perspective of, of this, uh, the effectiveness of the gospel in the wilderness is that, that we have treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. So this, this power is found in the gospel, right? Because before that verse in 2 Corinthians 4, he says that the, if the gospel is hid, it's hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So what, what, are, what are those people who the, who the gospel is, of Christ has shined unto, what are they able to do? Like, could they possibly be troubled on every side but not distressed? I mean, are they, are they able to bear about in their body the dying of the Lord Jesus that the life also might be made manifest? I mean, I think it's everyone's experience who's, it, who's been able to take hold of the gospel by faith that that is that the, the message that God has given us, the working of God in Christ is effective to keep us. Something I noticed this renewal is that God's gospel is a pleasing gospel. So if men are believing in the wrong gospel, it will be more like something they hate doing but they have to do. So I'm glad that God's gospel is a pleasing gospel to his children, so we are eager to listen to it and preach it. I'm sure you've all noticed that in this renewal, everyone's insights have increased greatly in what the gospel is and what its work is. And something that came to mind in all of this is just one of the results of the gospel. I mean, God said in his covenant, he said, they will, I will be their God and they shall be my people. And no man will teach anymore his neighbor saying, know the Lord, for they all shall know me from the least to the greatest. In one of my main passages that I had spoke on, I spoke about Christ coming and taking fiery vengeance on those who know not God. That to me tells us something about the gospel. It's that through the gospel, men know God. And it's the only means by which men know God. And it's not intellectual babble. And it's not just simply telling us in just mere words. But it's a display of what the Lord has done so that we might know him. All erroneous statements about God, all false statements are owing to not knowing him. Any of you who have close family and friends, if someone says something that's not true, you can tell them that that is not correct because you know them. Likewise, through the gospel, we have this knowledge of God. And we have harmony amongst us as a result of knowing the Lord. So what I'm throwing out there is the gospel is the message of the Lord. It's a declaration that the Lord has done, but it's knowing God himself. Amen. As Brother Al would say, now, now think about this. Think of the word news. News. What is that? That's a compendium of new things. N news. Amen. There's a lot that God has accomplished, and it's all new, and it's all good. <laughs> anyway, I got to thinking about it. I'm going to dwell on this a little more myself, this news.
I'd just like to publicly give thanks to the Lord for uh, the gospel being relevant to each and every person, and that we have all sinned, and there is righteousness available. He's, he's died for the sins of the whole world. I've heard people preach sermons uh, to a specific issue or to specific audience, uh, which really didn't apply to me. But I'm just thankful that the gospel applies to me and applies to each person. And I'm thankful for those who are uh, willing and eager to speak it to provide edification for the whole body. By way of contrast, the, with regards to the, the identity of the gospel, the identity of the gospel is critical because there are other gospels out there. The complicating, one of the complicating elements to that reality is that these other gospels have a Jesus, a heaven, and a church. There are family gospels, marriage gospels, career gospels, finance gospels, there actually is more danger ex, uh, ex, that exists in a lying gospel than there is in pure worldliness. I find that in the fact that Jesus said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. He never did say, beware of this ruler named Nero. Now Paul, the apostle, was he not beheaded by Nero? But there was no warning given about Nero. John the apostle warned about religious dangers. Paul, P Paul the apostle warned about religious dangers. Peter the apostle warned about religious dangers. And Jesus, uh, of course, did also. Paul said in Galatians chapter 1, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. There's a, it was a counterfeit. It was, it was a, as it's been said already this week, it was, it was another gospel that was uh, dressed up like a sheep, uh, but it was actually a wolf that was dangerous, that was ravenous, and that was even lethal. There is um, another contrast that I've thought of, that the gospel is of no use for obtaining worldly recognition. The gospel is of no use for attaining comfort or ease in the world. The power of the gospel cannot be extracted and used for political agendas or borrowed and used for personal endeavors. It's not functional in those. Now, there is power in the gospel. It is the power of God unto salvation. So the gospel is effective in that thing for which God sent it. And we might say that the gospel has never been and will never be hijacked for another purpose. It, won't, it, it, it can't be like the power of the gospel can't be transplanted outside of the purpose of God, outside of the will of God. It is only effective in what God, in what God is doing. Someone um, somewhere started saying that we, we preach the gospel to sinners, but we teach saints. I mentioned that in passing in my message, but there's more that I wanted to say about that. That has actually... Uh, it, that's like an attack on the identity of the gospel. What that means, what that, is, that, what that is affirming by implication, is that those who are presently believing don't need the gospel. That it's only needed by sinners. That it only, if that's true, then the gospel only provisions for our initial entrance into the kingdom. And after that point is, is not needed if we only preach the gospel to, to the sinners. 
that would mean that it, it is only effective in conversion and initial forgiveness. But what about sanctification? What about endurance? What about perseverance? Enduring unto, unto the end. Does that mean that the gospel has nothing to do with growing in faith? With growing up into him in all things? And as a body growing into uh, uh, a perfect man? Does that mean that it's unnecessary for, uh, being, for patience and for perseverance in the gospel? See, there's a lot of implications uh, to that. So the identity... Uh, of the gospel, I appreciate Brother Mike's uh, expression there that, that, that there's this certain entrance into the gospel or by the gospel. Once you're in, then like David said, you realize he's set us in a large room. And then, now the, the gospel actually, the message actually gets bigger after you come in. And it actually gets better after you've come in. 1 Corinthians 15 says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you. By the way, this is a message that's given to a church, the church at Corinth, which you all, which also ye received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory that which I have preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. So there's another aspect of the identity of the gospel is that it brings in, but it's it's designed to sustain and to keep you in, if you keep in memory what you uh, what you believed when you first came in. You have something, Brother Judah? Okay, Brother Judah and then Brother Silas. I'm just thinking in continuous thoughts of what Brother Al brought up and Brother Given expounded upon good news. That the news, I never really thought about it. It's kind of a good thing to think about that news is the word new with an S stuck on it. It is said in Scripture that all things are made new. God is the God of not of old, he makes all things new. And then, in relation to what Brother Aaron was talking about, of there being various diversities and spinoffs, if you will, of true gospel, that a, a gospel that does not require you to give up the old must not be a gospel. Because when you come into the gospel, God calls you, Gospel brings you in and it keeps you in. But if it doesn't require you to let go of what you had previously been holding on to and take a hold of the new, it must not be a gospel. Because in order to take a hold of what God is giving you, you have to let go of what you're holding on to that may be of the world, that may be not sin and of itself, but it's getting in the way of God. You have to let go of anything that is getting in the way of taking what God has given. Also, no sacrifice. You have to make sacrifices. A gospel that requires no sacrifices is not a true gospel. Because Jesus made a sacrifice, God did also. And that was no small sacrifice. So there's, there's a, an old hymn that has a line that says, We follow in his train. We make sacrifices because God also made a sacrifice so that we could be with him and all things that are new. Uh, Galatians chapter 1, um, verse 6 says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. And Brother Pat talked about this a little bit, but the gospel is good news, and really, what, what other good news do we have? There, there really isn't another gospel, so, so these things are only perversions of the gospel. But what other good news does man have? There, there's really nothing else. There's, there's really nothing else that's good news. And, and what, what the people were teaching in, in, to the Galatians was, that, was um, justification by the law. And that's not good news. <laughs> if, if my salvation depends on, on me following the law, well, that is not good news. And see, see there's um, the disciples said to Jesus, he said, will you go away too? And they said, to whom shall we go? 
You have the words of eternal life. See, this is good news that Christ has the words of eternal life. Nobody else has good news like that. Who, who else are you going to go to for words of eternal life? See, see that there is no other foundation that can be laid than is laid. See, see the good news and, and all the things that we have in Christ, you can't get anywhere else. There, there is no other good news. noticed that when when I think back to when I first started hearing the gospel um, and what I mean by that is that God gave me ears to hear it actually hear it uh, I remember it always thrilled my soul to hear it and and but then you join a church you know, you know what I'm talking about uh, there's a huge disconnect between the gospel and the perceived life, nature, and purpose of the church. I think most people would just simply associate the gospel with people joining the church. Most people would at least, most church people would at least say, and church leaders would at least say that the point of the gospel is to get people saved or to get them in, in. And of course, you have to parse even what that means many times. What they mean is in our church. Um, but it, it's, it is depressing, and I think all of us are here for these this same kind of reasons. I think I'm speaking for all of us as a group here, that we have all experienced profound disappointments with what is, with what is called the church. Because you go from talking about things like justification, eternal life, being forever with the Lord. You go from talking about that to talking about the PA system, the building program, staffing the nursery, and the praise band. And none of those things are evil in and of themselves, but that is a real downer after hearing the gospel. If those things become like our major preoccupation, that, that has, I, I just feel that there are millions and millions of people in our culture who have not, they've not heard the gospel, but they think they've already rejected it. And what they've really rejected is this dry, lifeless, insipid shell of Christianity that is Western Christendom. Now, the, I, I wanted to just make a few quick statements about the connection between the gospel and the nature and purpose of the church. And so here, I'll just make these statements very quickly here. The church does exist to preach the gospel. That is one reason why the church exists, both to saints and to sinners, as we've already established. But the church also exists to live out the implications of the gospel in fellowship with one another. In other words, when you believe the gospel, you are added to a fellowship of people who also believe the gospel. So you're not just a solitary convert. It's not that you just believe the gospel and then you go on your way by yourself. So there, there is a profound connection between believing the gospel and then being part of the body of Christ, being added to the fellowship of saints, saints that are here and saints that have already gone on. That is a, that is a precious and profound aspect of, or implication of the gospel. You can't say, well, I, you can't really say, I, I want Jesus, but I don't want any of the other people that belong to Jesus. You really can't say that or be in isolation. Now, once people believe the gospel and come into the church, the church should be the context in which sanctification begins and continues. That's, that's the context in which, and sanctification is an element of the gospel. It's not that we leave the gospel once, we, once we're justified. We don't leave the gospel behind. Part of the gospel is 
the process of sanctification, those parts of our lives that need to be lopped off, as it were, or those parts of our lives that need to be transformed into the image of Christ. The church, the reason for sanctification is because God wants to dwell in his people. Sanctification means holiness. And we know that God is a holy God who has to dwell in a holy place or in, um, in the midst of a holy people. So the, 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 at, the, the purpose of sanctification is not just to be moral. It's to be holy so that God can dwell and work in our midst. And when the, when the scriptures talk about God dwelling in us, that's not just the Holy Spirit dwelling in you individually, although he does. It's the Holy Spirit dwelling in us collectively as, as the body of Christ. So the purpose of this is for God to dwell. It says in Ephesians 2 that, that we're being built into a spiritual house or temple in which God dwells by his spirit. That is the purpose of the church. Ultimately, this will carry over into eternity where it says... In the book of Revelation, now the dwelling of God is with man, and he will live with them. That's the end of the gospel, or the, that's glory, the ultimate. So, so the church is to be working, see, with that in view. That's the purpose yeah. of the church. But I, I don't think this is, this is not thought out, because the church is existing as an institution, and then all of the energy is being poured into maintaining that institution. Things like uh, the building, and there's nothing wrong with the building. I hope everyone understands what we're saying. We're meeting in a building now. If we thought buildings were evil, we wouldn't be here. But if, if simply maintaining the, the infrastructure of the institution and getting people to come in who will then tithe and and maintain that institution, if that becomes the objective, well, then we have fallen far short of the glory of the gospel. In fact, most of the stuff that is called church today is not even impressive in a carnal sense. Like, it's not, like if I were a carnal per person, it wouldn't impress me, let alone when compared to the glory, to the glory of God. So there, there needs to be this more thinking, I think, out there and in our own minds of, you know, what is the connection between the gospel and our gathering together as the church, as the body of Christ? Seems like, to, seems like that's a deep well of, of uh, consideration. Brother Jason was talking about something that I like to call churchianity. Let me give you another snapshot of Sister Debbie and I's experience some months ago, and this, this goes to uh, what's been said by several of you about who we preach the gospel to and, and where, we, where we find the gospel recorded for us in the scripture. Some months ago, we spoke to a group, uh, a local Christian group in a restaurant, and they asked me, we were giving a report about our ministry work uh, at the at ARM. And before uh, I spoke, they said, we, we always have our speaker uh, ask some Bible question to see what everybody knows. And some of you will remember this. So I, I thought for a minute or so, and, and, and I thought, ah, here's, here's a good one. So I asked them, now these are church people from lots of different congregations. How many of the letters in the New Testament scriptures were written to churches and how many were written to unbelievers. And so they had 30 minutes to think about it. They could have even opened their Bibles and looked. There was two dozen people in the room. One person knew the answer. And they spoke first. They gave the answer first. Started with this lady. She said, well, all of them are written to churches. Everybody else in the room <laughs> After hearing that, even after hearing that, well, about half of them. Well, about five or six of them were written to unbelievers, and the rest of them were written to churches, things like that. They, they, they didn't even know the, the introductions to the letters where the, where the writer states who he's writing to. And that's what we're dealing with, see? Because we all know that the, that the bulk 
the vast bulk of the gospel is contained in those letters, especially the Apostle Paul's. That's, that's where we get the gospel. The implications, this vast room into which we've come, is written there to believers who are in trouble in, way, in one way or another, all of them except for the believers in Ephesus. Uh, those letters are written. Uh, Philemon's not written because of personal uh, trouble of faith, but uh, you get the idea. They, these things were expounded to bring the believers back on track again. They'd heard the truth. Paul said to the Corinthians, this is what was preached to you. He said to the Galatians, this is what was preached to you. See? So, so this is what we're dealing with in the, in the modern church, nominal church. They, they just don't know. They don't know. And some of them, one more thing, some of them, when you speak to this, to speak to them about this, when you tell them this, that the gospel is contained in writings to churches, to believers, primarily. I had someone who's been in church all of their life. This person's father is a preacher. He's been involved in leadership. He has Bible college education. And after speaking one day at work, many of you know I preach every day at work for a few minutes, every morning between 9 and 10 o'clock or 10 and 10.30, they said, why do you keep saying that? That Paul's letters were written to churches. What does that have to do with anything? You, you mention that on a regular basis. And I was able to say, because huh, it's true. It has been pointed out the, uh, another go what another gospel, the damage it can do, and the sustaining power of the real gospel. Well, I would say that's your evidence of another gospel. If at any time you've been seriously seeking the Lord, you're hungry and you've left hungry, you have not heard the gospel. Because that is just not what it does. And we, this issue about how whether, the sin whether it's designed to initially bring you in or keep you in, well, as far as initial goes, another gospel doesn't do that either. It don't even get you in. That's what this text that Brother Silas shared with us. He said, you've been removed from him who called you. That's another gospel. It doesn't bring you in. It kicks you out. And if I could put it this way, when any time a person's starting to get hungry, getting skinny, you could say, it's time to check the food supply. Because another gospel would not be a short amount. It's an empty food cabinet. I believe Brother Jason made a point of this when he is ministering how that the gospel has many different facets that it, it kind of expands. And in the body of Christ, there's some, there's some elemental facts of the gospel that are not, that are not clear to the, to the people. And, when you begin to deliver, so the, the, the gospel has to, it has to be developed in the minds of people. They have to see the largeness of it. It, it would begin like forgiveness of sins and things like that. But then it gets into this intercession of Christ. There's a whole battery of things that they are gospel. So the gospel isn't like a, a neat, concise message wrapped up in a tight ball and and you just deliver that. It's a very broad, it's like a river. See, it's like, it's like Ezekiel's river that was too, too big to cross over. That's right. And it, so there's a tremendous amount of liberty that people have here. It, everybody professed Christian is ready for some aspect of the gospel. And there's a lot of people in the world that are ready for it. But as you discern it, you can... Devote your life to it. <laughs> fountain flowing. That's right. And <laughs> um, one of the things that 
uh, stuck out to me was something that Brother Pat actually said in his message. And um, he said that when preached, the gospel clarifies. Yeah. And I think that we can all fellowship in that mm -hmm. statement from this week. And the reason why it clarifies is because it's language from our homeland. If, you, if you've ever traveled um, over abroad, it's hard sometimes to negotiate just the common things because there's a different language and you can't communicate. You don't understand what the other person is trying to say to you. But when believers gather together and the gospel is proclaimed, you're able to communicate with them and you're able to um, traverse and, and it expands and gets bigger because it's language from the homeland. And another thing that I really appreciated this week um, was Brother Jason. He brought out the fact about Abraham's gospel, and I had never seen that as clearly um, as I have this week. And I, I got to thinking about how the Lord had to call Abram out of the Ur of Chaldees. He had to get him out of a competing environment that would hinder him from believing God. He had to get him out, and we've all fellowshiped in that. Anybody that's come to Christ, they've had to come out of a competing environment in order to receive the gospel of Christ. So I want to thank you, brethren, for your labors. Amen. It's been well said that there's many uh, benefits that are promised to the people of God through the gospel. But we've also been given to see that the vast majority of those promises are not realized here. They're, 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 they're spoken about them being in heaven. What I want to uh, comment on and encourage you all in is, is in the surety of your reception of those promised things, those, that promised inheritance. It's sure. Brother, Brother Aaron was, 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 was bringing this, this thought to us about this building. See, if, you, if you're going to build a building a, a chief cornerstone is vital, is vital unto the completion of that building, particularly when you're talking about a building that's going to last forever and forever. If you're building a building that's built, going to last forever and forever, you better have a very solid chief cornerstone. Well, that, well the, what the gospel announces is that there is a chief cornerstone, and that chief cornerstone is Jesus Christ himself. Now, the, 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 the surety of those promises coming to pass to you is because God has made a promise to his son. In, in, the, in the promise that God has made to the son is the surety of your reception of the things that the gospel announces. And I just wanted to read this. This is from the, the prophet Isaiah in the 49th chapter who, who reveals this promise that God made to his son. He said unto, unto the son, it is a light thing that thou shouldst be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel. I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles that thou mayest be my salvation unto the ends of the earth. See, all the, all the, all the promises are, are encompassing around to the entirety of the earth, which includes the Gentiles, which I would assume that all of us here are. So the, the surety, the surety of your reception of the things that the gospel proclaims is because God has made a promise to his son and it's impossible for God to lie. He cannot lie. Um, never spoken to a microphone. Um, I heard someone say, I forget who it was, but they were saying that when you tell believers what God did, what he does, and just the gospel, tell them about God, that he gives grace to them when you tell them that. And um, Titus um, 2, 11 says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that Denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. 
So God's grace is teaching us and giving us the power not to sin and to even go the opposite way to live soberly, righteously, and godly while we wait for Christ to come back. So we can keep reminding each other of the gospel so we can all grow in grace. The gospel is a report on what God has done and what God is doing. The gospel is a message that needs to be spoken. The gospel also tells us that Jesus has come and died and arose on the third day. Jesus has told us to be um, baptized in Mark 16, 16. He, ha he that believed is baptized and shall be saved, but he that, don't, he that believeth not shall be damned. Brother Robert said in his, in his sermon, when the true gospel is spoken, baptized, baptism takes place. When Jesus, what Jesus has done and what he has said needs to be spoken, so people will be baptized and be ready for the judgment. Several of the brethren have mentioned this, this report, that the gospel is the report, and immediately my thoughts go to Isaiah 53. And so I turn there again to read this, and the first section of verse 1 there rep represents this, but I also wanted to look at the second portion. It says, Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? There's another aspect of the gospel there in that verse. It's the arm of the Lord being revealed so that men can see what God is doing, his intentions, his workings, his character, his ways. I remember in Luke that when Simeon saw the Christ child and he was giving his rejoicing at that time, he said he thanked the Lord that he could see this salvation with his own eyes. He said, which thou hast prepared before the face of all men. It's been prepared, and now in the gospel, he's making it known. He goes on, it says, A light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. Amen. The gospel. The gospel. Another aspect of this that, and, and I wanted to take a minute to thank the Lord. We specifically pray that the, the brethren here would be of one mind and of one mouth and glorify the Lord. And we see this in this discussion time. We've already seen it. But you, you know that as you've considered these things in your own mind and preparing to get up here and share that as the different brethren get up and speak, these things grow in your mind and your understanding. This is being of one mind. Amen. So another aspect I was thinking is that the gospel is the weightier matter that is not to be omitted. Um, Brother Tim brought this to my attention when he quoted the reference from Jeremiah. He said, what is the chaff to the wheat? The wheat is what is of, of substance, and this is what the gospel is. It's the substance of God. So it's, it's so weighty that it will crush anyone, Brother Gibbon, you mentioned this, crush anyone who is not seeking to be aligned with it. But it's also strong enough that for those who are seeking to be of the same nature, it will give a strong foundation. There will be a day that time will be no more, but today, the time is short. So let me offer a, a conclusion. The, as the Lord was leaving the world, uh, he said, he asked Peter three times, remember, do you love me? And uh, the appropriate uh, exhortation and direction to take out of that uh, conversation with Jesus was, feed my sheep. And so I affirm to you today that the preaching of the gospel uh, will feed the sheep, and it does feed the sheep. I further affirm that the brethren have, the, the, the saints have greater need for the gospel to be preached to them after they've come in than they did before. The faith, as faith grows, the, the struggle between good and evil in the believer, actually, the struggle actually increases. In other words, the battle gets, gets hotter. The saints have continual need to hear the gospel, and the gospel work actually is deepening, becoming more profound in the brethren 
as, as faith grows and as, as faith increases. So the, see, the need for the gospel to be preached and expounded is growing, and the, the work of the gospel is, is deepening and becoming more and more uh, profound. The work change, it makes this type of transition. Where the work of the gospel starts, it, it starts with things like thou shalt not. But then as it grows, it becomes laboring together with God. See, it's, it's making, it's making that, that transition. There are, there are first works of the gospel, and then there, there are th those works mature and, and progress. As that progression continues, the need for proclaiming the gospel also continues. There is a, a gospel. Part, the, the gospel includes the message of his present intercession, that he is ever living to make intercession for us. See, we didn't... We didn't hear that as we came in. We heard that, Brother Mike, after we came in, that, that entrance point. The gospel includes the gospel of the new man, the new creation, and the new creature. So there's, a, there's an old eye and a new eye. See, that's, that is the gospel. And that, has been, that revelation has been critical for each and every one of us to see that there's a new creature in me, and the old is not, is not I. The gospel is about heavenly citizenship. The gospel is about imputed righteousness. The gospel is about overcoming this present world. The gospel is of sanctification. The gospel is, of being, is being rooted and grounded in love. See, the gospel is a profound work and is a profound message. And I, I commend to you that, you that we don't grow out of the gospel. I, I could even affirm that the gospel work is going to continue in the, in the world to come because it has to do with the glory of God. There's not going to be an end. It's not like this, well, that was good while it lasted. What's next? This, this is God. It's God expressing himself. God manifesting himself. God is actually, he's building a temple in which he himself will inhabit. The gospel has everything to do with God. So, the eternal gospel, yes. Well, I thank you all, uh, brethren, for uh, sharing and declaring the things that you did. We've had a, a profitable time and uh, it's been good for us to have, have been here. Let's